reporting from Washington, D.C., and welcome to this unique event. Oh, man. As much as I love being here on the brand new elected news set, I really wish I could just be in Washington right now with the candidates at the debate. Where am I? Oh wow, this is really cool. Huh. Wow, everything just feels so close to me. I feel like I could just reach out and touch you. Oh, does anybody want a chair? I've got a chair here. Joe, I know you want a chair. Come on, man, let's do it. Disrupt everything in the meantime. Well, this has been cool and all, but I really should get back to the elected set. Oh, that's much better. And you're watching the elected show. Welcome to the Elected Show, Coronavirus Debate Edition. I'm your host, Luke Radel. On Sunday night in Washington, D.C., the two top contenders for the Democratic nomination, Senator Bernie Sanders and former Vice President Joe Biden, battled it out on CNN in the 11th primary debate, which may potentially be the last. Now, in my personal view, this debate was full of flaws and tactical errors for both of the remaining candidates left in the race, but I do believe that one candidate edged out the other, both on policy arguments and debating skills. But before we get to who actually won or lost a debate, let's talk about the moments leading up to this pivotal moment in the 2020 race. Leading up to the debate, the qualification set by the DNC made it pretty clear that Hawaii Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, who is still in the race, would not qualify for the debate on March 15th, requiring that all candidates on the debate stage acquire at least 20% of the allocated delegates from the first 25 states that had voted or caucused. Congresswoman Gabbard had not met this requirement, garnering delegates only in the Michael Bloomberg stronghold of American Samoa. But she was still not happy about the DNC's rules. We hear a lot of talk. We just celebrated International Women's Day and the progress that women are making around the world. But when it comes to actually making sure that in this presidential primary, that the only woman candidate left in the race, the only woman of color, and the first female combat veteran ever to run for the presidency has a voice, the DNC and their corporate media partners say, no thanks. Actually, that's not what we want the American people to hear. Now, in my opinion, I think it would have been appropriate to have Congresswoman Gabbard on this most recent debate stage, especially considering her recent proposal for a Yang-like UBI stimulus in response to the coronavirus. Having a third alternative perspective on the issues, regardless of whether or not she is a woman, would have created a more enriching debate environment on Sunday. Not only was it unclear whether Tulsi Gabbard would be on stage for the CNN debate, but it was also uncertain whether or not Senator Bernie Sanders would make it for this next event following the results of Super Tuesday EE. Sorry, no, oh. Super Tuesday 2. My bad, it's Roman numeral. Senator Bernie Sanders did not have a good night in South Carolina or on Super Tuesday or on Super Tuesday 2. And even worse, he's also not poised to do well on Super Tuesday 3. And I know it can get a little bit repetitive after a while. But the main takeaway is that many people were questioning whether or not the Vermont senator would stay in the race, especially after losing the Michigan primary to Joe Biden, which he narrowly won against Hillary Clinton back in 2016 and reinvigorated his campaign. In his home state, Bernie Sanders addressed the concerns surrounding the future of his campaign. Um, what became even more apparent yesterday is that while we are currently losing the delegate count, approximately 800 delegates for Joe Biden and 660 for us, we are strongly winning in two enormously important areas which will determine the future of our country. Poll after poll, including exit polls, show that a strong majority of the American people support our progressive agenda. On Sunday night, in the first one-on-one -on -one debate of this campaign, the American people will have the opportunity to see which candidate is best positioned to accomplish that goal. Thank you all very much. So Senator Sanders decided not to drop out of the 2020 race, but based upon the tone of this speech, it seemed clear to many of those who had experience in the political arena that Senator Sanders had recognized that he did not have a clear path to the nomination, 
but would stay in the race and in the public conversation to further a dialogue with the potential nominee about his progressive policy platform. Many hoped that Senator Sanders would do this subtly, by nudging Vice President Biden towards the left of the Democratic Party. However, if Bernie is known for one thing, especially coming out of this debate, it might not be his subtlety. You have been on the floor of the Senate time and time again talking about the need to cut Social Security. All well and good, but nowhere near enough. Why don't you get rid of the super PAC that you have right now, which is running very ugly negative ads about me, by the way. <laughs> don't laugh, Joe, that's just the truth. <laughs> you have in the past, on more than one occasion, voted for the Hyde Amendment. It's not a question of re-entering the Paris of Court. That's fine, who cares? Well, all right. I mean, I think one of the differences, not to you know, pick a bone here, is I have been consistent. All right? I've always believed in that, and you have not. I'm glad you have changed your view. So yeah, Bernie Sanders did in some ways subvert establishment expectations about his debate strategy for Sunday night by tearing Joe Biden to shreds for his past and present positions on almost every issue. But some might argue that this may serve to help Sanders. After all, Bernie's not the frontrunner in this race anymore, but he still has a shot at getting the Democratic nomination, and he wants to be aggressive in pointing out the flaws in the current frontrunner's record in order to take back his status as the presumptive Democratic nominee. In fact, that strategy sounds kind of eerily similar to one used by a candidate in the last debate. Bernie Sanders adopted a strategy from, of all people, Joe Biden. The strategy used by him in the South Carolina debate on CBS that feels like it took place years and years ago. This strategy is to go aggressively after your opponent, especially on the issue where they're weakest. For Bernie Sanders, that was guns. And for Joe Biden, well, it was a, a lot of things. But there is a big difference between Bernie Sanders now and Joe Biden back then. The main difference is just time. When Joe Biden mounted his attempt to unseat Bernie Sanders as the Democratic frontrunner, only three states have voted. Now, 25 have gone through the ranks. And it's not just about how many states have voted, but also how many candidates are left in the race. Joe Biden was able to consolidate all of the moderate wing, Buttigieg, Klobuchar, Booker, Harris, Yang, all behind his camp, while Bernie Sanders really has no one left to consolidate. And Elizabeth Warren has still held out on her endorsement. However, Senator Sanders was not only focused on taking down Joe Biden, as that would kind of be inappropriate in a time and place where everyone seems to be squarely focused on the coronavirus crisis. So Bernie Sanders used the coronavirus crisis to elevate his own policy positions as the correct way for the American people to go, not just in a time of emergency, but all the time. Okay, let's be honest and understand that this corona virus uh, pandemic exposes the incredible weakness and dysfunctionality of our current healthcare system. Now, we're spending twice as much per person on healthcare as the people of any other country. How in God's name does it happen that we end up with 87 million people who are uninsured or underinsured, and there are people who are watching this program tonight who say, I'm not feeling well. Should I go to the doctor? But I can't afford to go to the doctor. What happens if I am sick? It's going to cost thousands of dollars for treatment. Who's going to feed my kids? We are the only major country on earth not to guarantee health care to all people. We're spending so much money, and yet we are not even prepared for this pandemic. How now, this created a tough bind for Vice President Joe Biden, who supports the Medicare for All-like benefits during an emergency situation, but not at any other time, which even led to him listing off all the benefits of a Medicare for All program, but adding a caveat. No one has to pay for treatment, period, because of the crisis. No one has to pay for whatever drugs are needed, period, because of the crisis. No one has to pay for hospitalization because of the crisis, period. That is a national emergency, and that's how it's handled. It kind of sets up a weird dilemma between what treatment should or should not get paid for. Hey there, I'm a doctor. Oh, hello, doctor. Um, I'm very sick, and I have the coronavirus. Oh, no, that's awful. Well, your treatment will be free. Wow, thanks so much, Doc. Of course, it would be inhumane of us to charge you, considering that you're very sick. Uh, he hello, doctor. Um, I have, I have cancer. Oh no, that's awful. I'm so sorry. Well, you can get treated, and then you'll have to, uh, pay for your treatment. Well, wait a minute. Why, why do I have to pay for my treatment? He, his was free. Well, yeah, but he has the coronavirus, and he's very sick. Well, 
well, I'm, I'm very sick. I, I have cancer. Well, he gets it free and, and you don't. Because of the crisis. Not only did Joe Biden tend to lose the coronavirus debate on Sunday night to Bernie Sanders, he also lost it to Donald Trump, who is his presumptive opponent. He should have focused more on President Trump and pivoted towards the general election throughout the debate, but instead he led some pretty clear questions where he could have gone after Trump, go by him. Like this one from Jake Tapper. Under Vice President Biden, President Trump says he does not take any responsibility for the problems with coronavirus testing, in part because he says he inherited so many rules, regulations, and red tape. Did bureaucratic red tape hamper this response in any way? No, look, the World Health Organization offered, offered the testing kits that they have available and to give it to us now. We refused them. We did not want to buy them. We did not want to get them from them. We wanted to make sure we had our own. I think he said something like, we have the best scientists in America, or something to that effect. The idea that we are not prepared for this and not, and, and the, the other thing I want to point out, and I agree with Bernie, offered the testing And I'll stop his answer right there because he just interrupted himself in the middle of a we sentence that probably could have gone somewhere them. like we did not pointing out how the president has shut down the White House pandemic office created during the Obama administration in response to the Ebola outbreak back in 2014 to prevent pandemics like the coronavirus or Ebola from surfacing ever again. And the president shut it down. And that could have been a way for Joe Biden to draw a perfect contrast between himself and President Trump. But Cannot he didn't do that. He goes on in the rest of his answer, not really so to directly mention the president again. He was perfectly set up by Jake Tapper to make the case against President Trump in the coronavirus crisis. And instead, his answer felt a little bit more like this. And Joey Biden steps up to the mound. He's prepared to hit this one right out into the outfield. And uh, he's getting ready for it. And uh, uh, I'm good. Oh. So in summary, I think that Bernie Sanders did a better job overall in this debate, but honestly, it doesn't really matter because Joe Biden's probably going to be the nominee anyways. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and use elbows.